Thank you. Let us proceed to the next uh, session. It is a great honor for giving the role of a moderator of this panel on the subject of how we will upgrade the national health system and how the collaboration of the world will define the future of healthcare. Starting by what we said, because the primary health care refers to the society and any feedback or reforms should have uh, an important foot print on all aspects and the connection of society with public health is clear. So quickly, and we will have a Q&A session in the mean, between the, between the speeches. Let me give the floor to Madam Asimin Gaga, the alternate minister, the Ministry of Health, and give you the floor. Thank you. I'll make the presentation, but before that, because I listened to the previous uh, roundtable, I have to say in these 30 years that I'm a physician in the national health system, that has never been a programming of what kind of um, physicians we want. We submit for specialties at any hospital with no criteria, and this has always been valid. It is high time we said how many specialists we want in each speciality. Who will attend that? As it happens with all European countries, and how many general physicians we want, and we must have them because these are the ones that we can relate with the needs of the patients in the country. So, if we are to speak of the primary health care, we must start from education. This has never happened to date. I totally agree that uh, coverage are substantial for new hospitals. This is how new hospitals can be sustainable. This is how important how we structure hospitals. Primary care is most important for every citizen and every corner of the Greece. Health services must be offered in every village, every city, and the big urban centers before reaching the hospitals. But in order to have that, again, we need general physicians and the personnel that will offer this care. And another issue that was uh, underscored, public versus private sector in Greece, which indeed has the biggest and most extended private sector. No country in Europe has this 40, 50 percent private hospitals. This is not necessarily bad. It's something that people want. Therefore, well, probably we must let for better cooperation between the two. Besides, all physicians are the same, nurses are the same, and the only way forward is complementarity and cooperation. And allow me to go to the podium. like to speak of the pandemic and the day after. And I believe that we must all f remember is that the mission of the Ministry of Health and of all physicians and nurses and health professionals at large is to prevent disease and fight disease. In order to do so, we must create an environment of trust, first of all, and quality of services of health services, so it's for that to be understood by the patients. And this environment should also offer fulfillment and protection to the healthcare personnel working there. These are the two things. The one thing is what we offer to the patients and how we can prevent disease. And the second is how this is experienced by the healthcare personnel working in the system. What did we do during the pandemic? How has this changed things and where are we currently? During the pandemic, many things changed. The first thing is that we had to get involved and take care of each other. How we get dressed, how we get undressed, how we pay attention not to be contaminated, not to transfer the viral load to the community. So we're very grouped big group, and this is important. And the second is it was an, a huge opportunity to staff the whole health system to be, uh, we had tremendous purchases uh, and donations. We all have new equipment, uh, new beds, uh, and new personnel, uh, rich personnel of the existing one that is in the specialty that already existed. One does not have the time to create new specialists. 
one needs five or six years to be trained in a new specialty, and we had a great inflow of new specialized physicians. What are the plans of the, for the future? And we haven't left this, the pandemic yet. It seems that we've got a fourth wave. And let me remind you, in India, there is a region with 1.5 million residents where 100% of the people are vaccinated. In India, where the average income was 450 euros per year, they saw the benefits. We have, they have been vaccinated 10%, they say wonderful. We have uh, been vaccinated 60% and we grudge. No, we did very well. The important is to see the bright side. Of course, it's important to speak with all the institutions and as a ministry, we want to have contact with all people. We want communication, of course, based on scientific data. We're based on education of the physicians, of the nurses, of the whole health personnel. We are based on the way we should convey things and in all cooperations with the universities, with the private sector, all cooperations that may lead to a better, uh, a higher health level. In order for any strategy to be deployed, we must understand how the world changes. And we saw it. It's the world changes because we may have pandemics, because we have personalized medicine, and this is something desired. We, it, the world changes because we have patients with strong voice that enter and intervene the decisions, and it should be so. They tell us what they want. We must have a far greater emphasis put on preventing medicine. We must have the needed education for the health services, of course, the appropriate information. There's a huge change in the technology, technology evolution from diagnostic equipment and diagnostic and pre-screening to molecular techniques, new treatments. There's a huge technology that offers a lot of potential, great potential, and a great change in the way you communicate and the information and general uh, 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 population gets information. And of course, there's always a problem of finances. One needs lots of money so as to have a good health system and include the good screening, diagnostic screening, and good treatments. There are all the other factors, the climate change that gave these wildfires in the summer and brings about all the changes in our lives. The aging of population, which means a great uh, com comorbidity that we have to face. And of course, a lack in uh, health personnel that we don't see it only in Greek. We also see it in Greek where we've got this uh, brain drain from, med from medical personnel, but we see it all over Europe. The two things that we want to do as a ministry related with primary care. The first is education of physicians. As you said, our physicians, when they graduate, they have to go to a regional office. A, a graduate knows a lot in paper, but in practice, things are far more difficult. So we start with one-year foundation. Let us have a one-year foundation, as all European countries do, where our graduates will have at, an at least six-month practice in a field to be able to take the history prescribe for the first time under guide and direction. They will have seminars for emergencies, for the use of incubators, for external ventilators. And when after this foundation, they will go to the rural uh, office. We don't change that, that is, but we make a substantial rural service because we must remember we owe this training to the physicians and we must not send them barefoot to thorny fields, and on the other hand, as a state that trains physicians for six years, this is a desired training. On the other hand, we want to get something back. Our patients need physicians at the region, and this we do it through the service of the rural areas. Gradually, things will change, but for the time being, this is something we need in Greece. So this is the first part. There are a lot of other things in training, and not only medical training, but also of nurses, of uh, rescue teams. We must organize seminars, and we've already started, for dealing of trauma amongst the citizens. So as if there is a trauma in mountainous Kios, for instance, or mountainous Nafpaktus, or remote islands, to have someone that will know how to deal with uh, an injured person, who know how to 
TI, a trauma, how to use the air ventilator so as to have the patient, uh, the injured person, arriving at the hospital in a re- relatively speaking good state. So it is important how we train rescue teams, nurses, med- uh, physicians, but also citizens. And this we must do because we have a society, a community that must feel that it has our protection, our care. This is called excelixis, I believe, the way we move ahead. And we move ahead together and only posit- positively. I have been head of the European Immunology Company for 18 years. In 2018, 2019, we conducted a major research in order to see what fi- what is of a threat, what we see as positive. This is a survey conducted amongst physicians, pharmaceutical companies, insurance companies, EMA, everyone, you name it, and 250 patients associations. And I give you here what the patients want. So the patients said that diseases will change phase. We will be living longer and we will have greater comorbidity. And this means both problems and cost. Therefore, we should be dealt holistically for what we are, each and everyone, whatever we bear, diabetes, hypertension, you name it. And personalized medicine will be better in addressing those problems and offering us what we need so as to live longer and better. Other things that the patient said, we will be embracing new technologies. We will be able to follow our disease through a monitor from distance, we'll be able to converse with our physician remotely, we'll be able to have better treatment because technology will assist us. And there are already available of uh, ultrasound, for instance, uh, uh, devices that may so if we have a problem in a pulmonary area and have a diagnosis from the USA, for instance, unbelievable new things offered by technology. And we may also monitor our patients through telemedicine. This is something that we saw during the pandemic and was launched with great thirst. And furthermore, they told us we will be consumers of healthcare. We may have to pay for a part of it, but we're expecting better services. This is also important. That's why I'm telling you that 250 patients associations with many answers offered. Now, why do we lie in Greece? We need the reorganization of health services. We have 124 hospitals, not 140. We have 197 health centers. We have multidisciplinary general offices and uh, 1,318 remote practice. We also have 44 special practices on boats, for instance, staffed by the Ministry of Health and in the prisons. What changes is the e-file of the patient that has already been launched, which means that uh, each one will have one's uh, uh, effort. The, the, this uh, will have uh, access to this uh, personal file, and we will be able to have a cross not to search through the history of a patient. A lot of work has been done with Ithika. We already have e-prescription, and through which we can see what the patient has got as prescription five years before, what was the medication administered, and gradually on this platform, we will upload the lab results and the history of the physician, which is most important. It radically shifts and changes the way we do Uh, we practice medicine. Of course, all that needs collaboration. Now, what are the incentives that can be offered to physicians and nurses so as to go to remote systems and come to the national health system? The first, of course, is financial incentives, definitely. And the second, scientific incentives. That is, if we take a physician to a remote village where he loses contact with new data and evolution, it is important to have a digital interlinkage with a big university clinic, a big health system hospital, so as to have scientific interlinkage, interconnection, but also for work, services, service, whatever, that will help building up his resume for the future career. And of course, at the same time, we must have evaluation and assessment. Finally, we believe that as ministry, we want to be open, to be present, and be accessible. We want to be the 
ministry where things will come in, it's nice to have continuum. It is important for the Ministry of Health to be at the center of develop- developments. Of course, we will be speaking with all institutions. It is important, but we must be organizing the strategy. And we can't have each uh, authority and each institution working separately. We have many things that want to help us for the strategy. We gladly pay heed to them, but strategy remains in the ministry. And finally, as we proceed with all procedures and process, we are here both for the patients and the personnel, and we can do great things together. Thank you. Uh, Dear Minister, thank you very, very much for this broad, fair, and very synergistic understanding of the current situation and, of course, for sharing with us your insights. Uh, Let me remind you that, uh, let me remind everyone that primary health care calls first for political will, strong uh, financial resources in order for uh, the sustainability of any venture. But in order to discuss that, there is no one uh, more, uh, let's say, Uh, competent to tell us more about that is the General Secretary of the Primary Health Care, Mr. Mario Simsoklaus. You have the floor. The microphone is off. So, uh, the speaker is back online. Uh, previous speaker said how b- poor we performed in terms of the vaccination campaign and the schedule, etc. Now, let's talk about the day after uh, in the healthcare service. But first, all right, that's the one. But first, we have to understand what uh, uh, what the current challenges are, how we dealt with the pandemic. That's the practice, and what is the thing we will use in order to build uh, the day after upon the main challenges. Um, alternate minister already mentioned. Uh, the most important of them. I don't want to spend time on that. So, the pandemic is here. It won't uh, go away this year. There's no magic wand to help us with that. It will be accompanying us for the next 12 months. We have social and financial inequalities. We have been through a financial crisis uh, in the past 10 years that shrunk uh, the um, volume of resources for the healthcare system. And we also have an aging population. Uh, So managing chronic diseases uh, is an additional uh, piece of this puzzle that we have to uh, put together in order to build the day after. So what happened in the primary health care system in the past 12 months, especially about talking about state-owned infrastructures, who it's for many uh, were unable to carry this workload. Figures speak louder than words. Because of the vaccination program, we fail to see what the public health, primary health care structures have done. So, beginning October 2021, one year ago, we have had more than one million citizens of ours being tested. I'm talking about symptomatic ones in the regional practices and centers. An entire system was Uh, let's say, developed with specific rooms, uh, uh, COVID-specific rooms, etc., and approximately one million fellow citizens of ours with symptoms have been uh, examined. And we're talking about 50% of the entire number of examinations uh, under the national healthcare system. So if somebody says that we didn't uh, perform, give me an answer to this one. Second, Operation Freedom. This is the slide which is quite dense. I don't want to stick to that. Let me just say that we have proven that we were able to make a design to have a strategic plan from A to Z and develop all tools and supplies that were uh, in scarcity in our country because back in October 20. Because in October 2020, uh, things were not like the way they are. Now, on November 5th, we announced for the first time that 1,018 vaccination centers under the umbrella of vaccination centers will be under the first, under the primary healthcare system uh, will put in place. Some people were reluctant. The ones who were ill-intended made fun of us. Now, eight years after that date, because many said something about the failure, 
we are just 4% down compared to uh, EU average of completed uh, vaccination, 5% down compared to EU average of uh, one job vaccinated. Uh, so we are seven, we rank 17th in terms of the total number of vaccinated people. We are number. We rank 17th in, term, in terms of the number of uh, fully vaccinated in, uh, citizens. It would be great to have had the previous speakers available. And in order to bridge that with the primary health care system, let me say that Operation Freedom um, achieved the, fa the foiling theory turned into practice. It wasn't just a bill. It wasn't just a plan or a voted regulation by the parliament. Everything was put in place. All speakers, including the previous ones, professors, etc., talked about uh, global and universal access to primary health care system. This was never the case in our country, with the exception of our vaccination program. Vaccination allowed to have to have non-vaccination centers used for the vaccination of everybody, poor people, rich people, former kings, businessmen, civil servants, unemployed, um, uh, athletes, etc. This was the first time that this happened in our country. Second thing, provision of high quality healthcare services. All citizens, and this will also uh, bring me to my next point, all citizens, especially the elderly, uh, tormented for many, many years by the Greek state were able to make it to the vaccination center at 11.52. They were vaccinated at 11.52 as well from, uh, from our staff, requalified, reskilled. All procedures have been standardized so that in the month of May, we have had more than 11,000 people employed under the Operation Freedom. Currently, we have 30,000 vaccinations per day, and we have more than 7,000 people uh, employed. Those coming from various organizations, ministries, public or private organizations as well, they were working under the same circumstances, using the same standardized procedures to produce the same result. Point three, digitalization. We've been saying that for many years. Digitalization on a 360 basis. Starting from the email um, we received about the new uh, incoming volumes of vaccinations, uh, which is the entry of the vaccination to the uh, country from the actual self where the vaccine is available, one might say, okay, so what? No, it wasn't like that. Back in October 2020, things were not that simple. And digitalization until point Z, which is the 1,100 vaccination centers using uh, IT system, uh, tablets, and full digital communication with our citizens. We discussed with them via SMSs, via emails. We provided them with a very simple way to um, have an appointment, even for those who are not that tech savvy, uh, even those uh, who uh, would get some reminders for the vaccination. And this is the way forward for the day after. As far as the day after is concerned, we have discussed about the primary health care uh, service in which an holistic approach of diseases has to be implemented. We have to. Um, to consider to determine the pathway, the patient's pathway from the point of prevention. We have the Doxiadis project, the, uh, including specific prevention uh, centric uh, procedures, then handling the cases, managing chronic diseases, and after these first stages uh, are completed and after the full digitalization is attained, we will have uh, financing based on the results achieved. Uh, see, I have no more time. I'm already beyond the time allocated to me. Now, these are the pillars for the future uh, policies. We have to facilitate access uh, to uh, the healthcare services. Personalized care, that's very important because we have to introduce a model in which every patient will have his or her own private physician. We have to reach a point as a country in which every citizen will have a doctor assigned to them. And after we do that, we have to make sure we have the so-called gatekeeping. Will it be a hardcore one, a soft one? Will it be an incentive-based or counter-incentive-based one in order to move from the primary health care to the second tier? These are the four axes uh, already with already guaranteed financing. Actually, we are on track, or uh, I would say we're even better compared to the schedule uh, with the involvement of the RRF. We're talking about refurbishing the um, the healthcare centers, those under NSRF or not. We're talking about the upgrading of their uh, 
medical and technological equipment. And the most important thing is the reorganization of our administrative model and the reskilling of our staff. That's something we place great attention uh, to. It was something that was made easy uh, during the vaccination uh, pr program so that we can uh, have the so-called network, which means the patient will receive the same quality of services, be it in a primary facility, in a private facility, or a state-owned ones. I don't want to say more about that because the alternate minister was quite uh, uh, eloquent. We need the EMR, the e-file. This will be fully deployed in the future, in the months to come. We have already taken steps so that we can have this pathway set. We're talking about telemedicine and then the so-called digital. Uh, transformation of the AOP so it becomes the prevailing organization in the market so that it can become a very important pillar for the third degree of healthcare services. Thank you very, very much. Let me thank you, Secretary General, because you observed the time and you even saved us time. And I would like to stress that indeed. You actually reminded us uh, in real action the principle of uh, equitability. You remind us that when we compare at the end of the day, you remind us that we should know the starting point and you also the principles uh, of, from your deeds because simply the field of prevention has to do with the connection of the community with the primary care and public health and I help you for that. The next three interventions are through video conference. We'll start with Professor Kyriakos Suliotis, who is Professor of Health Policy and Rector of the Peloponnese University. I hope you can hear us. Good, after, good evening. Thank you for the invitation. We speak of the primary health care along with the loss of a woman that has offered a lot in the field of health. I have preferred certain slides, but uh, the previous speakers have given me a lot of incentives and uh, nice passes for my speech, and I would like to st start with certain comments. I adored uh, the excerpt of uh, the alternate minister where she presented the viewpoint of the patients. We have missed a lot of time and energy planning the system towards the lobbying system, interests, professional interests. And we don't try to structure a health policy on the needs of the patients. I'm extremely glad, and this is symbolic now, that a large part of the speech of the minister concerned the viewpoint of the patients. So we paid heed to what the patients say, what politicians don't tell us is the way they will overcome or ignore political cost. Because you know, political cost is the result of the lobbying of various interest groups. This goes hand in hand. We recently co-authored the book with Pavlos Kiriopoulos, where Pavlos Tsimas made us the honor to write a small uh, introduction, where he says the day after will be radically different. I am absolutely certain that the world will be different the day after, especially the world of health. So. The desideratum is to draw the lessons from that experience, to learn from our mistakes. During the economic crisis, the first thing, the first reflect, reflective was for the country to reduce the prevention expenditure. We must learn from our lessons. Another error is that we allow for many health systems of various speeds, even amongst the developed countries. You see the great divergence in vaccination rates that delay the so-called return to normalcy. And thus, we now have to invest far more in the health system so as to cover the voids. Before the pandemic, we are almost at the EU average, half of the EU uh, average in beds per citizen. We covered a large path very quickly, swiftly. 
we must add resources for dealing this uh, with this obvious uh, threat and we did well and we saw great uh, pressure with regard to the use uh, of hospital services and relative expenditure from that experience of the pandemic however i believe that we should focus on what we can invest the fact that the european viewpoint uh, in, on the field of health has changed and is no longer austere of the kind that each uh, effort uh, of intervention should be for cost containment is something excellent because we are a, a country that we subfinance the system for many years but to my view we should not limit ourselves in what should be done but we should invest in analyzing attitudes if we had Uh, deficiencies is because we didn't solve the things. The vaccination program is a success story for the country. We were never uh, accustomed to such levels of organization, respect to the community, to the citizen, operation of new technologies. Where did we ever, it was unfathomable to have a, a reminder of our vaccination through SMS and then a reminder for the next uh, job again through SMS. If we have such deficiencies, this do not concern the planning and organization, but some that certain next steps. Let me share some findings from a series of studies conducted through the pandemic. Let me remind you that from a research from the first wave of the pandemic saw that the 25% of the virus is constructed artificial and serves a goal. And this conspiracy theory also gained amongst the physicians at the percentage of 10%. You realize that in such a society, it's very difficult to identify attitudes that one wants. An equally shocking finding is that 80% of the population avoided any contact with the health system. And this made us uh, rose great concerns, obviously, because the known use of health services will appear and research at a later stage with four more exacerbated needs. Because we know when the 80% of the population avoided contacting the system, we know that under normal conditions, 70% of the population makes a frequent use. Therefore, out of fear of the pandemic, these people stayed away from the system. So we must be prepared for an exacerbated uh, need uh, and conduct to the system in the immediate future. Now, from the pandemic, there are good and bad news. From the original handling, we have a very high in increase of the trust rate. It's important. When we speak of reform, it's very important to have a universal social support, if not universal, a satisfactory one. And we see out of the handling of the first stage, we have an important part of uh, the population declaring that they have increased trust. But we see that this uh, uh, yields succeed, uh, recedes at the second stage. What is important that now second study, we see that the percentage of people believing that the virus is uh, artificial and it is part of a greater conspiracy, we have see this rate increasing. So the way we have handled the, the piece of news per se, and I speak of the mass media and the TV time they gave to exaggerated views, undocumented, will be now based whatsoever because they merely would raise uh, their ratings. You know, at the stage of the pandemic, we had the feeling that there was a debate between the physicians whether we should be jabbed or not, which is not based, it's totally unfounded. And to my view, the, the mass media is accountable for all that. Amongst the, these uh, alarming uh, findings, 17.5% declare that they have problem of access to the health system, especially with regard to medical visits. That is the first visit with a physician. This, during the pandemic, became 33%. And it's obvious there were additional hurdles. But anyway, the system put the emphasis on dealing with the pandemic, which is, of course is only logical. It happens in other countries as well. The institutional trust vis-a-vis -vis organizations dealing with that was reduced. 
well, there was a polyphony, if you like, and perhaps cacophony and exaggeration in handling the information. But on the other hand, when you have all those voices saying all these extreme views, I don't see any other way we could deal with this epidemic of inaccuracy and fake news. The view for the system was deteriorated by 43%, but 26% increased. You see that for the vaccination program that has excellent reviews. Before the pandemic, our studies showed that an important part, 75% of the population, consider that vaccination should be um, compulsory, generally speaking, especially for those having children uh, following education. The good news is that we have an increase uh, of vaccination due to the fear of getting sick and having to have recourse to hospitals. We also registered a window of 56, 57 percent window for the third wave before the vaccination at the end of 2020. But something should also see what happens behind those findings. A large part, 37 percent, say that they will not be vaccinated. Of these, 60 percent consider that clinical trials were too speedy and they are not safe. Now, those who believe that this is a part of a conspiracy, they can't be convinced otherwise. It's a broader uh, mentality and uh, worldview which is outlayered. You can't change it. But 59 percent, the communication will suffice on whether there is uh, the rational time for a clinical trial or whether a clinical trial depends on the voluntaries, the number, the interest of the scientific community, the money paid, the velocity in exchanging information so far. All these views are really sad. Here you see the overall assessment of Greek uh, uh, society of the vaccination program is positive, more than 50 percent, and this is what we expect. We wouldn't expect anything less. We are not surprised by that. And 8 percent, they are against vaccines at large. And let us come to the gist. The primary health care is our pending issue. We have been carrying it for decades. Citizens over the last years, in this study, we see it every single year, they underscore the need of a structural reform of the health system. But listen at the contrast. Most of them believe that reform is something negative. They believe that reform is something negative. This is reiterated every single year. The simple explanation is that they are afraid. Most uh, common is because we speak of a uh, reform, but it's not materialized, or it is very limited, and it doesn't seem that bring about important changes. Where do we all here? We need documentation merely from a comparison between overall expenditure, public expenditure, with a comparable country, which is Portugal. We can't be compared with other countries. We see that our system is subfunded. So a general message, we must uh, secure the necessary resources. We exceeded the phase uh, of fetishism and of uh, a taboo for the health budget. Another issue is we must seek for integration. In all those studies on primary health care, you'll see that the notion of uh, integration is uh, of primary importance and the issue of balancing of uh, fiscal targets with health system. And by that, I mean that we must exploit all the available structures. I cannot understand the insistence on the relation of public and private sector when the citizens give us the answer. We see here the most uh, usual contact of the citizen with the health system is out hospital and lab tests no originality, nothing changes. What is original and special is that in all studies conducted by us on an annual basis, the greatest part of citizens, because they have some kind of private insurance, and we want to explain that. Is it a choice? We want to pay from our pockets so as to add more money to the five billions? Or is there something else happening? This is what will give us 
the recipe. And the recipe is the following. We try to see, we try to offer services who have not learned how to wait. So we seek for a private physician that has a contract with National Hospital. So we will have to pay and have a financial hurdle during our access to the public health system. Here is the structure, the slide of the hurdles for at the course of access of the citizen to the public health sector. We could only have this slide and start from that and create a new system. How? By having PPP, the structure of local administration, university, whatever you name it, under a single contract with the financial reward that take into consideration the result, but also that the satisfaction of the citizen. This should be taken into consideration. For instance, is it, isn't it a public sub-product, the medicine that we buy from the drugstore when this is reimbursed? Of course, it is. But there are some certain myths that do not allow us to see the obvious thing to what citizens really opt for. And the best example for that is this slide that is in the lab services where all the structures are from the private sector, there's no problem. Have low prices with an excellent percentage of reimbursement from the state, and the citizens have access to a huge network of private structures. So I agree with the Minister who have a very extended nexus of private sector, but this is not necessarily bad. Similarly, we have a huge number of physicians, but if we had the programming of specialties or the system, system of assessment evaluation, we would be able to get the best to have excellent physicians in the health, national health system because we have the privilege to select from a huge pool. But when we don't have such safeguards, then the prerequisite, the, the prerogative, if you like, becomes a, a defect. We have... Uh, a plethora of information with AI, and AI can transform this uh, individual information to broader single information. We have the nice things in the age of the fourth industrial revolution. We may still be like the Luddites, but anyway, we must see the, the glasses half full. The pandemic reminds us two things. The first is there's something intrinsically linked with health system, uncertainty. No one could uh, forecast that we might have a pandemic. There have been many publications that might suggest that we could have a pandemic, but there have been such studies for other pandemics that didn't appear. But we have great advantages. Now we can have exchange of data, and a health problem in a country may become a health problem in another country. There's extreme uncertainty, and the only way to deal with that is documentation. I will agree, everything is evidence-based health policy. It's high time we spoke of evidence-based health policy, especially in the field that concerns primary care. The rich ideas, we have proven that we can plan, and I refer to the vaccination program. This is an excellent organization basis. So as for the political system to dare, to my view, society will be supportive to an extended reform, starting from the primary care, which is also the first contact of the citizen. There will always be uh, complaints. There will always be populism and then uh, um, people who will be adverse due to petty politics. This always happened. No one has to be involved in such uh, uh, thinking. And one must move ahead on the basis of the experience of the pandemic that show us how important a strong public health system is. With this, I warmly thank you for your attendance.
Thank you very much, dear professor, especially for reminding us of the uh, circumstances of extreme uncertainty and of extreme inequalities, and also for the fact that you gave us the perspective through the healthcare services user perspective, uh, highlighting uh, the long-term uh, weakness we have. Maybe this is, uh, uh, this is the time when Mr. Kiriopoulos uh, is proven right, because two years ago he said that the pandemic was a virtual experiment uh, to confirm the quality of uh, the health services uh, and of uh, the degree of uh, responsiveness. Uh, and actually, he, uh, the pandemic uh, drew the carpet uh, away from uh, the garbage we had underneath. Now, moving on to Mr. Anargyros Mariolis, General Practitioner, Director of the Aeropolis Health Center. Mr. Mariolis, thank you for being with us, for being connected. I hope you can hear us. I think we can hear you. So you have the floor. Thank you very much, Mr. Papataxiarchis, for this kind invitation. I think the previous speakers helped a lot. I think it has to be made clear that uh, this adventure our country and the global community is going through uh, has inflicted great injuries to our society and our economy. At the same time, it uh, disclosed opportunities uh, to receive teachings and uh, uh, to proceed with changes in the healthcare system, and especially the primary healthcare sector, as already mentioned, and of course, uh, opportunities to improve our performance. At this very point, I'd like to warmly congratulate Alternate Minister Mrs. Gaga and uh, General Secretary Mr. Themistoclos because their contributions uh, are governed by a completely different uh, spirit, let's say, and they are human-centric. And also for their daily uh, work, they seem to be um, infallible, and that's how we see it. Those of us working on a daily basis in remote areas, that's how we see it. Like my case, uh, the same applies for other colleagues uh, working also in uh, uh, urban centers. So investing in primary health care is an investment to our country's defense. A, to establish a new uh, stability, a new balance in terms of uh, economic uh, growth, sustainability, social cohesion. As the uh, Prime Minister had stressed, this is a social necessity. And this necessity, he was committed. Uh, to take care of by means of the huge reform that will take place in the coming months, a huge reform on primary health care. This uh, reform agenda of the government and of the Ministry of Health in particular allow us to be certain that it will be a successful one. And I explain why we believe that given the contributions by the previous speakers. Currently, uh, primary health care uh, civil servant is invited to offer his or her services in the same way uh, as in the past while the crisis uh, uh, intensifies the dead ends and uh, the, the difficulties. As it was mentioned by Mr. Gaga, Mrs. Gaga and Mr. Themisokleos and Mr. Suryotis, we need the primary health care that will be the pillar for open and free access to everyone. For many years we've been saying that the primary health care should be the point of entry for anyone in the healthcare system and must aim at satisfying the health care, the health related needs of the population. And this will be the only way to uh, tackle with uh, uh, the waste of uh, uh, health related resources. Uh, however, in the long term, developments, technological ones, alongside uh, new social and political coefficients. Uh, and the WHO uh, set new challenges uh, to the to the healthcare systems. You mentioned before the Astana Declaration, and the Secretary General also touched upon that. We don't want a primary healthcare system that will be just a pillar of a modern system, and that was also evident uh, in the presentations. That's why I'm so happy to be part of this roundtable. They and ourselves, so we present an overall vision on the basis of uh, collective participation, uh, equality, and uh, global uh, coverage, universal coverage. These were the concepts that have touched uh, the Greek society in the past months. The vision of, uh, uni of uh, a universal coverage and a universal uh, 
fulfillment of uh, social needs, like uh, the Spiros Oxiadis program, uh, as far as prevention, palliative care treatment is concerned. All these, all these uh, concepts are govern the famous declaration of Astana. But apart from the main repercussions of the pandemic on mobilities, the pandemic itself was also linked to specific uh, consequences. And let me give you an example from the primary health care, mental health. The quality of life, clinical cases of depression, uh, the um, multiplication by eight of uh, suicidal tendencies uh, shows the multifaceted challenges that our population has to face, uh, both in urban centers and in remote, uh, in remote areas. And this is also the case for the uh, health provider, the operator. Uh, this is something described 30 years ago, and this is what we see right now. We have innate uh, parameters, external ones, that um, aggravate the moral dilemmas for health professionals, especially during the pandemic, and that also touch upon bioethical concerns. Talking about the primary health care uh, professionals, which include the lack of workforce, the fulfillment of uh, alien tasks. That's why we're talking about a restart of primary health care. Uh, we have to prioritize the provision of service based on specific guidelines. Uh, also, the difficulty mentioned before, and the very correct uh, Secretary General said so, that we have to have to secure uh, universal access to non-COVID, universal access to healthcare services for non-COVID patients. The question is what we can do about that, and Mrs. Gaga said about uh, telemedicine, which played a very important role. We do have an issue with uh, the family doctor as, uh, um, uh, as an institution, uh, which means that we're still waiting for... Another issue is the, um, the adverse effects of isolation of health professionals in remote areas. Maybe we could have done down what we want is a high level of health care, of primary health care system that goes hand in hand with the overall health care system, offering comprehensive services, which means cover to a great extent the main demand the, the main requirements of the population, both in terms of individuals and families and at every stage of their lifetime. Mrs. Gaga mentioned the issue of uh, medical training. Uh, that was correct. But we're not talking about the uh, internship of our colleagues. We're talking about the training needed in our colleagues already working in the primary health care system. And that's why we need a set of courses of at least 300 on the job uh, training for all uh, health professionals in the uh, system. So in order to attain the sustainable and high level health care services, given the weaknesses of the system, COVID-19 uh, built new barriers. Uh, for instance, exclusive access uh, the undermining of uh, personalized treatment, the focus on hospital treatment and uh, expensive uh, biomedical um, uh, technologies. Uh, Greece has the second lowest uh, uh, out-of-hospital expenditure compared to the OECD uh, countries. The payment of high fees to private doctors. Uh, also, barriers to access, for barriers to um, certain populations, certain parts of the population for accessing healthcare services and high out of pocket charges that impede access to healthcare. Mr. Papataxiarchis, in order to secure sustainability and uh, trustworthiness of the system, we need deep reforms based uh, on the primary healthcare system so that we can meet. Uh, the requirements need uh, set by chronic diseases. And the main problem we currently have now in the primary sector, which is the treatment of chronic diseases, diseases so or chronic patients. We need long-term investments. And this may deliver if it is based on complementarity and synergies between uh, services. For instance, comprehensive primary health care systems. Mr. Mrs. Gaga gave a figure about that. But this um, also relates to a series of different 
um, let's say, aspects of organizing the units, starting from the uh, centers of health uh, in small villages up to uh, the main hospitals. In order for that to operate, to deliver, uh, we need to have comparative prioritization of, uh, of our works are based on uh, the international literature. Financial benefits from investing in primary health care are not, questioned, not questionable. We have visits by qualified uh, non-documented therapeutic uh, interventions, not needed interventions, uh, costly pay uh, visits by specialized doctors. All these things will be saved if we invest in primary health care and public health. Based on what we mentioned before, in order not to uh, spend more time, I think that national policy on health seemingly emphasizes on restructuring primary health care, but it has to take the form of, of specific commitments. The core of this endeavor has to include the political commitment to prioritize this issue in combination with the necessary investments on, uh, um, on the workforce and the uh, gear needed, the equipment needed. So the state has to draft and support a comprehensive framework of uh, supporting the primary health care. But this has to follow the rules of bioethics, uh, evidence-based medicine, and meet the requirements of the Greek population as Mr. Thesson, Mr. Klaus mentioned in another uh, address of his. We have to take into account guidelines by international organizations and also to take into account the recommendations uh, by the local um, organizations. Such a reform will help us go well beyond the pretentious uh, distinctions, uh, distinguishing between uh, different units, private ones, state-owned one, state, one, state -owned ones, uh, local government-run ones, etc. We have to merge all these into a single functional network, as is the case in most EU member states. Organizational and functional interconnection of these units will take place on the base of on the basis of common and coordinated services uh, contracts. Uh, and I use uh, specific terms, but these contracts have to describe the obligations, the tasks, and the specifications of the quality of services offered and the results attained and the specifications of the uh, premises uh, involved. The aim of that will be to attain uh, uh, common goals. The objective will be to meet common goals. So we have in a cooperative way to promote uh, synergistic um, initiatives. Mrs. Gama, Gaga said something about collective internships, clinical medicine and prevention one, uh, prevention related ones, promoting efficient use of resources. And in summary, this way we create a comprehensive network made of a specific local networks. Every network will be made, will consist of uh, private or public uh, facilities like TOMI, centers of health, uh, clinics, etc. But the parameters that have to be taken into account, and that's what Mr. Thames has already mentioned, is uh, the urban. Uh, planning for these units and based on the needs of the uh, reference population because the, there's a different demand in Laconia, another one, different demand in uh, uh, Glyfada and a different one in Spetses. Uh, and, the, and this will affect also the set of services offered. In this reform, the pacemaker uh, has to be in the hands of the family doctor. Ending talking about the training needed. Once again, congratulations to Mrs. Gaga for talking about uh, the incentives for all health professionals, especially the primary health care, uh, primary, primary health care sector. Incentives on pre-symptomatic control, uh, behavioral sciences, bioethics, and the philosophy we need, the change of culture that is, when talking about comprehensive health care. So thank you very much. And before I rest my case, I'd like to say something about full digitalization of transactions in decision making. 
until today, many steps have been taken via Ithika, but when talking about medical and administrative uh, decision making, this has to be take. This has to be done on the uh, on the basis of transparency and full availability of data. Why did I mention that, Mr. Papataxiakis? Because there is a multi-dimensional potential benefit for the patient, for the society, and the healthcare system if we do that, and for the national economy. Thank you very much. Warmly thank you for four brief points. First, you demonstrated the dynamics of functional uh, interconnection and integrated system, saying that, that what we will see is a union of the deficiency of the existing plus the knowledge of the deficiencies that we witness and how they will be improved. You raised uh, the emphasis and dilemma. Third, you give me the opportunity because the politicians that I have in, I had in front of me, what we've had are indeed a different kind of methodology of vision, documentation, perspective, and it's true. And finally, because your presence always reminds me the following. When 1988, three specialties for the first time were introduced, that is gener general medicine, now I see it, it's evolution in family, social medicine and vocational medicine. The first did something, the second did something, the third nothing. And assuming responsibilities for what did not happen lies somewhere there and is also the subject of the discussion vis-a-vis -vis primary health care. Now let us come to the last speech. But for us, this is also the level of the absolute sensitivity of uh, the session, and this is for Madam uh, uh, Katerina Kutsoyani, who is the president of the Brick Patients, Patients Association. You will give us a touch of breath and sensitivity so as to balance. Thank you. I also thank for the invitation. I believe that this conference has shown long time ago that amongst the speakers, it always involves any representative of the patients. And, the, and I'm extremely satisfied for that. Indeed, I have been following from the beginning the deliberation of the conference. It's very interesting. Let me also say that uh, this table, this round table is extremely interesting with the practices, the practical uh, speeches done to date. Let me express my satisfaction by the presentation of the alternate minister who really referred to the convictions of the patients, but also the remark that patients should be involved in the decision-making process. It is something that you know we have been fighting for for a long time, and I believe it's high time we materialize that. Let me also say and corroborate the reference of Mr. Themistocleus and Mr. Suliotis vis-a-vis the satisfaction rate of the patients of the vaccination program. It is indeed very high. And our association from the beginning was a, a great supporter of this effort. We tried to formulate proposals so as to have a problem, slight problem with the setting the priorities that was restored with the operation we have with 1132 hotline we received we received the, the claims and then could communicate and gave solutions i'll try to be brief in my presentation i have uh, pre prepared a small in relation with the proposals of the Greek Patient Association on how it can contribute in the upgrading of primary health care, which we consider extremely important. And indeed, the pandemic has demonstrated the necessity for a very strong primary care. I will proceed with the first slide. For, with some general statements. I believe that I'm already the second slide. 
And I would like to say that indeed the pandemic, we all see that had multifaced impact and had a great uh, impact, especially with the way we did that we have a greater threat because they are more vulnerable to the disease and because they also experience indirect impact on their health since they have uh, hurdles in their access to the health system. The, this data in international literature where we can conclude the important reduction in new diagnosis and pre-screening for chronic diseases in many states. This burden is a great challenge for the day after. Therefore, an integrated policy is needed for dealing with all the health needs of the population that is directly or indirectly affected by COVID. In order to be strong, stronger primary care, the first uh, rank is a necessary precondition. In the next slides, I believe it is extremely interesting. I have concentrate. I have here some changes that took place in various European countries and certain adjustments that had to be made so as to be able to respond to the needs that derived from the pandemic. In the first slide, we see that in these countries, there was a restructuring of the first degree health care services with a strong interlinkage with the community services. I believe that all these practices can greatly help us as well, so as to view how can we improve those services. In the next slide, we see uh, that Greece also appears. Here we have exploitation of digital tools and systems, such as uh, e-prescription, telemedicine, so as to pursue the continuation of the care. It's quite important that our country as well, within this uh, difficult period, managed to overcome and serve through e-health the patients. We see here in some countries a restructuring of responsibilities in extending the validity of prescriptions of chronic patients and the information of patients on health issues. How that is, we had the involvement of drug stores in servicing the chronic patients. Another useful practice, we see that in these countries, they established additional fees, which is quite interesting, I believe, for primary care suppliers who had a very increased workload as well as increased danger due to the pandemic. All those practices are very facilitating, I believe, to help us see how the other countries dealt with this crisis. And I come to the next slide where I will be presenting some of the proposals made by our association, the Hellenic Patients Association, with regard to the restructuring of uh, primary care. We propose the upgrading of primary care structures and restructuring of their organization so as to be effective as a frontline care in close cooperation, of course, with a second degree. Redirection of available resources 
And the mark setting is a priority and the center, the primary care. We know very well that without money, nothing can be attained. And no upgrading can take place. Implementation of a long-term but also realistic program of public health, placing the emphasis on all three degrees of uh, prevention, primary, secondary, and tertiary. Free selection of a physician, be it family, doctor, general, general physician, in the framework of a well-structured system, exploitation at the same time, assessment, most important, of all structures uh, and the health services uh, supplies in a uniform way, development of integrated services with exploitation of uh, all contracted physicians so as to do away with geographic imbalances and inequalities in access, development of multifaceted uh, units, 24-hour uh, that would operate around the clock in all regions. I believe that Madame Gaga referred to 197 health centers. It's a quite number. We also propose the organized exploitation of municipal uh, offices, which is also an important uh, network. Madame Gaga referred to 1,300 such uh, practices, so we can conclude how important a role they can play in uh, primary care. And now I proceed to the how the our association can help in uh, implementing these changes. And this will be with my second before last slide. The representative of the patients at large can participate in the planning, implementation, and assessment of all those reforms, making use of the patient's experience so as to have timely identification of eventual ailments of the system. We can organize information campaigns for the dissemination of the existence of these services, as well as the uh, facilitation of uh, understanding the way these services operate. This is most important. So as for primary care to really serve uh, the society and how patients will learn how to navigate the system of primary care. We can also have uh, general population information campaigns on issues of prevention and public health, such as vaccination, uh, screening, uh, virus tolerance and resilience, and others. We can also have interventions in the family and shaping a lifestyle that would reduce the degree for chronic diseases and the change of habits vis-a-vis -vis smoking, nutrition, physical exercise, and so forth. Our association can also contribute in fighting fake news. A lot has been said about the issue of uh, fake news. And we all understood the importance of a timely and reliable uh, information of patients and the general public at large. So through our networks, we have a, a fundamental positive contribution in disseminating the right information. We can contribute in promoting uh, health literacy of the general population through specific programs in cooperation with the Ministry for Health, local administration, scientific and academic society. We can contribute to organizing uh, actions for the improvement of the relation of the health services use with the providers of health services, something very important, so as to build uh, a relation of trust and uh, feedback of information. This will be extremely important in the field of health. I have finished with my presentation. Perhaps we might leave some time for questions. I warmly thank you. Thank you, Madam Kutsoyani, 
for the eight proposals and the seven commitments that you mentioned for the day after of the primary health care and also for the for tracing the international landscape and the change that were affected due to the pandemic and your presence is very useful to anyone who would be operating on the rationale of preparing any changes that are to come. There are many we mentioned a lot. Uh, allow me for the end. The minister, a comment from you. I'd like to start with uh, Mrs. Kuchoyanis' uh, contribution. We have had an amazing flow uh, collaboration till now. I uh, hope, and I'm sure this will be strengthened so we can reach the day after in the primary healthcare sector. Uh, in her presentation, he gave us some, uh, she gave us some amazing figures. Uh, we agree, and uh, they may also be used as our own input for the road map for the day after. And a comment uh, for the remaining two gentlemen. Both of them are great partners. We don't have some kind of administrative uh, connection, but they are great partners. I'd like to thank them for the help, both uh, in terms of the vaccination campaign and the plan, uh, the design of the primary health care system. I also want to say that the contributions were amazing. Apart from Ms. Kuchoyani, uh, which uh, who I don't know, I know Mr. Kuchopidis, uh, your president, I think it's of primary importance to be able to discuss and exchange with our patients because at the end of the day, they are the, uh, the recipients of the services. And Mr. Markidis, Mr. Chiliotis, I think it's an amazing panel. And it's great the fact that all of you are the most competent one to discuss about uh, health, patients, doctors, and uh, health finance, uh, health economics. I, I think we have to f have all of us at the same table. Those people and the insurance company, they have to be part of this game in order to have a better uh, health care service. Also, the local government, uh, they also have to be involved. I believe that dialogue is very important and that everybody has to have a say has to have a say, and decisions have to be taken following uh, discussion. And, of course, there has to be a point at which discussion ends. Now we take decisions. That's, that's how we change the system. And, of course, at the same time, there has to be some room for improvement, some evolution, which means to assimilate new facts, a new input in the system, and uh, the new requirements, new drugs, new patient needs, everything new. We have to assimilate that quickly so the system is not passive and rooted to the old stuff as it was 40 years ago. Thank you very much for that. That's all I had to say. I'd like to thank the organizers. This is the most important health-related uh, conference uh, for the, of the year, the health world. Thank you for the quality of your contributions. Thank you. And of course, allow me for not uh, having a Q&A session because we have a protocol that we have to respect. And of course, we are already in delay. Thank you very much. Have a great day. Have a, uh, uh, be strong.